Father Lord, we thank you. You are all that matters. We are here to worship you, O oh Lord. Father Lord, please accept our worship, O oh Lord, that we have given you today. Lord, let your name be glorified today. Speak through me, O oh Lord, and speak to me. Open the hearts of the people to receive your word this morning. We thank you, O oh Lord. We know that in your presence there is fullness of joy. Lord, we are here to receive what you have for us. We thank you for your presence, God. For you never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for what you are doing now. We thank you, O oh Lord, for what you will do. Take all the glory, Father. Be exalted. For in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the choir. Anyone blessed so far? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just want to um, quick announcements that the youth, young adults, um, let's turn the lights, the youth, young adults who have a short meeting after service, you are welcome to the Youth Sunday in the month of July. And thank you all for being here, those as well that are online. So today, we'll be looking at an interesting topic. We'll be talking about the power. I mean, we've, the impact of power. I mean, we've seen, we've seen some individuals, uh, whether it be it in the workplace, in the school, these people were like, they were just, um, quiet or something on their own until they got some kind of position of authority. But for example, I remember uh, back in you know, high school where someone is, is just, they, they, are, they come to class and they leave. And then for those of us that remember just to have, uh, when the teacher is away, they will put one person in charge, writes the name on the board list of noisemakers or class captain for a, a moment. All of a sudden, their eyes are open. There's an there's a outburst of, oh, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge. So their attitude changes whenever there is some sort of authority that's given to them. For some people, it's on the good side, whereby they know, okay, I'm in charge, so here it is, let me go ahead and put the class together, or let's go ahead and put this workplace in one, in, um, in the right position, whereby for others is, now I'm the boss, so you have to listen to whatever I say for that small moment, and when the power is taken away from them, they're like, ah, I want, I, they're asking for, oh, please, do you need, do you need noisemakers again? Or do you need this to be in position? There's, there are two sides when it is that we have, we're given authority. Or as we say in this uh, sermon, power. When we have that power, what, how do we respond? You know, um, you can think on it on yourself if you've been given some sort of authority. How have you responded? Some have done both whereby, you know, we were trying to put the place, you know, together in one piece. And whereby there are some times where we're like way back. Assume that we're like just, I'm the boss now. Listen to whatever I say. So what is really, what is power? You know? It's a word that has, you know, multiple meanings. A few ways Merriam-Webster defines it is a physical might. 
when you have, when somebody is strong, the physical might be powerful. Or the possession of control, authority, of influence over others. We'll be looking at the latter definition, the possession of authority or the possession of control that one has over others. Now, there are some humans that are drawn to power. There's some humans that are actually, you know, they, they like that I'm in charge, I'm the boss, I'm here, I'm there. Whether it is they want to use it for the good or they just want to be, they have that insecurity that uh, this is when I'm, up, when I'm out there in the top, that is when I feel like I'm somebody. Whereby there are some people that they don't like it at all. If, even if they say, oh, I'll make you the boss and you're like, oh, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. I would rather be with somebody that is in authority. They would rather go ahead and say, I, I know this person or I'm married to this person that is in authority. I, I, I like to be, um, example I've seen in the churches, I like to be you know, pastor's spouse. I like to be pastor's wife or something, but I will not be the one that is I, the head of the church, but just the, the title. They like being drawn that I'm attracted to someone that has the title. So not everyone has that, oh, I want to take the title, but there are those that will still like, okay, I can be with, I know someone, I know someone, like Obi oh, Pei, you know Justin Trudeau, for example, we took a picture with him, the whole, the whole world we hear, there's no quiet at that time when we know someone in authority, because their status has changed. So today we'll be looking at We'll be looking at um, two people that had power. We'll be looking at two people that had power. And how did they use it? Now, one person was Saul. We'll be reading the Bible passage. We're starting from 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 and 2, which is reading the first two verses, 1 Samuel 9. It says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bechorath, the son of Athia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power and he had a choice and handsome son amen mm. whose name was Saul there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel oh, I think they were looking at me when they were writing that verse <laughs> from his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people. Now we see, going back to verse 1, it's talking about the father, a mighty man of power. So Saul is born into this family that's you know the father is rich the father's a he's a used when power is used here is used like he has authority over multiple sh sheep multiple donkeys animals and when back then when to say oh you have this amount of oxen it's or sheep is equivalent to today of you have these cars you have all this luxury so was a mighty kish you know was a mighty man of power a big man in Benj in the tribe of benjamin at the time so 
he has now this son and this son is an important you know he's he has the, his name as an important he has servants for him because he's born into a big family and he's living his life doing his own thing there's a time now that Samuel We'll go back a little bit just to give a backstory. Samuel is getting old. He's the prophet. He is also, you know, the seer. He's the last judge. He's a judge in Israel. And the people are saying, your son, your sons are... You're a mess. They're not the people that would, we know that God would not pick your sons to take, to continue after you. But we are seeing other tribes and we want to go ahead and, or other nations are having kings. So give us a king. Give us a king. We don't, we want a king. So quite funny that uh, Samuel did not learn from Eli. Eli's mistake because Eli had sons that were a mess going ahead to cheat people and say give me the raw food I will go ahead and take this and take that directly so that they can cheat but Samuel did not raise his children as well in the way that they should go so that's where this problem really comes in So people are now fearing that Samuel's children, you know, Samuel doesn't have a heir that will lead them right. And they want a king. So Samuel goes to God. He's saying, uh, these people really want a king. And God is saying, give them what they want. Give them, give them a king. Just go ahead. But warn them. Give them some warnings that if they go and get a king, this is what the king would do to you. He will take, you know, take you, your children for war. He will take some of your goods. He will make you pay tithe, um, uh, pay taxes more than you really would like to. Just letting them know that these are all the things that you will get. And they're not good. But the people say, uh, yes, we know, we know, we know. But we'll go ahead and still, we still want a king. The people think they know what they want until they get what it is that they are demanding for. So that is where Saul now is... His father has lost donkeys, a couple of donkeys, and he's going ahead to find the donkeys with the servants for his father. And he's unsuccessful in finding the donkeys because you're, you're not experienced with animals as much. You don't really know where to look for these kind of things. and. Saul has this issue of you know, finding something he's unfamiliar with, taking care of a group of animals he's unfamiliar with. And he says, let's go to, let's, let's step out, let's step away for a moment. Uh, let's go back to our father because our father will start getting concerned about my father was like getting concerned about me. And he hears that Samuel now, who's in his old age, is passing by. And so, no, he said, let's go ahead and meet the seer. Probably he will have something, a word for us. On his way there, God has told Samuel, this person is coming to meet you. Paul is coming to meet you. And 
let him know that he will be king. Know that Samuel is not too happy because he's, you know, gone back and forth with God. And all we know is that he's Saul is unsuccessful with finding donkeys. So Saul gets told, now you're going to become king. You're going to be going into power. But it's interesting to point out that this is without God's full approval. This is God saying, just give the men what they want. So now we see a man that is going into power without God's timing. We know there's the people that chose Saul, not God. And one thing to point out in 1 Samuel 10, 8, when Saul is being talked to by Samuel, one of the things after being anointed, it says, you shall go before me to Gilgal and surely I will come down to you and offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. Seven days wait. This is what Saul is being instructed. Saul goes ahead, meets his uncle later, and he doesn't tell his uncle I'm king now um, or anything because he's trying to keep himself back. So, one characteristic I see here about Saul is that when he is chosen to be king, the people are looking for him. People are trying to find who is the person, Samuel, that you now go ahead and anoint. And the Bible tells us that Saul was hiding. His hide to give him away, but he was trying to hide. So here we see someone that has insecurities. I don't know what it is that uh, I'm not meant to be who would you why would you pick someone like me? I'm only a Benjamite. I'm only he's not he's not ready to go into power. He saw himself as very little. You see that in uh, 1 Samuel 15:17. No, how small. You were little in your own eyes. Were you not the head of the tribes of Israel and did not the Lord anoint you over the king of Israel? So, do you see a king here that is still seeing himself as small? Just like how we seen here... Uh, we saw when the 10 came back out of the 12 for the, for the tribes. It says we were like grasshoppers in their own eyes. Saul also saw himself as little in his own eyes. How do you lead the whole country when you are not even secure about who you are? The effect of that is that he goes into power and in, you know, 1 Samuel eleven seven, he goes ahead, took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, sent them throughout territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers. Whoever does not go with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to this his oxen. You don't know how to converse with the people, so you cajole the people to obey you. 
this is how Saul believes he should lead the people. I'm going to go ahead and give you a threat so that you follow me. He has, you know, um, one other thing is that he does not have a strong relationship with God. You cannot lead God's people if you don't have a strong relationship with God. He asks in 1 Samuel 14, 37, he goes ahead to ask, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not, but the Lord did not answer him that day. Whenever you are leading a people to follow after God, if you do not know the person you are trying to get direction from, there is no, it's no point. So just to stop on Saul here, there are three things that we point out from his position of power. First is that he was insecure because he did not put his faith in God. He does not have his faith. He doesn't follow. Another thing is that he was impatient because of fear. You see that Saul was told to wait seven days, but later in the reading, uh, time not permitted to go into, but we see that after Samuel did not come on the seventh. He went ahead to make the sacrifice himself. He was also, the third thing is that he was rash in his decision making. Not just did he make the sacrifice himself, but we, he went ahead to place a curse on anybody that eats anything. He said, anyone that eats of this honey before we defeat the Philistines, the person shall die. And later we see that he go, um, Jonathan was not there when he made that proclamation. His son comes back and eats of the honey. And is arguing, why, why can't we eat of the honey? Because you all are weak and see how my, the glory on my face is renewed. So why can't I eat out of this? You all should eat out of this. And they go and tell Saul. And Saul, in his decision, rash decision making, goes to tell his son straight, because you have done this, you will die. What kind of position of power is this? So this is the kind of person that wants, you know, just like that, I want to be in power. But let's look a little bit at the other side. The second person You know, that we'll look at is David. This was the next person to become king. And it's quite interesting. Saul was, in, Saul was king for 20 years. After being anointed king, I'm scared. Let's uh, give us a king now. Give us a king now. Samuel goes to anoint David. So Samuel would have lived another, Samuel still lived another 20 years. If the people were, the, their decision on getting Saul that ruined Israel was out on the fear that Samuel was going to die. But we see now that Samuel was still alive 20 years later because he goes ahead to anoint David. David is known as a man after uh, God's heart. He was anointed by God, not man's decision. You know, David was someone that before he got into king, before he got into the position of power, he was also already executing what a king should do. He was someone that was being watched before. It was, he was someone that has proven 
that this is, if I am put in this position of power, these are the kind of attributes that I will show. We, should, we know that he was being watched because when Saul, when the spirit of God left Saul, that you're no longer going to be king, he was troubled and he was looking for somebody to go ahead and perform exhortation, um, you know, remove the, the, the demon out that Saul, the troubled spirit. And we see in 1 Samuel 16, 18, says one when they asked who will help remove this troubled spirit it says one of the servants answered and said look i have seen a son of jesse the bethlehemite someone from bethlehem as well who is skillful in playing a mighty man of valor a man of war prudent in speech and a handsome person I don't know who was watching David like this, but this, this at this point, this is uh, it's a little bit too too much <laughs> to be watching. That he can play, he's fine. He's uh, he's a man of war. He's all this. This is you know. So, and the Lord is with him. That's how he ended. The Lord is with him. So David now, anointed king, Saul is no longer, you know, the Lord is no longer with him, but he's still thinking, I'm in power, I'm still, I still want to be in charge. Is going ahead to play. He plays the harp and the spirit leaves Saul. On the side note, another importance of music, it doesn't say that he prayed for Saul. He played an instrument. And the exorcism happened. This is how much the Lord is with him. That music is able to cast out demons. He's in a position of power. He goes ahead and you know, still listens and obeys, obeys the people that he was in bef with before he entered the, before he was anointed. And one of the examples we know, we tell the stories to our kids all the time is you know, the story of David and Goliath. David is taking care of sheep. Uh, one thing uh, scholars will say that we believe that David was about 15 years old when he was anointed king. People say maximum 16, that based on the fact that in the time of David and Goliath, it says there were three of the eldest brothers that went out to war. And in that period, you have to be at least 20 years old to go into war. So people did a little math and in the worst case scenario on where David was the eighth, the last child, he would be around 15, assuming everybody was born one year after another. And then Dick Goliath also calls him a young boy. So he's not even looked as an, as an adult. We live around 16, he's anointed maximum if any of the first two were twins. No, but seeing how young he was, A teenager given a position of power and is still obedient to his dad. He's obedient to the people that he's under the authority of. He's protecting sheep. We know David was really good at the sheep. Um, we all read Psalms 23, which you know, uh, it's quite interesting to note that uh, Psalm 23 was re written in his last few years of um, being a king. He still remembers, you know, that 
there was a time that I was a shepherd. And the Lord is my own shepherd. He's the one that protects me. He uses the experience he has of protecting the sheep to understand how God protects us and how God provides for us. I shall not want, I shall not be looking, you know, for food since I was young. Now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, not the son of man begging for bread. So David understands this, you know, Saul was very, he, he had no understanding of on where to find donkeys, but David will tell you if he's, I'm finding a sheep, this is where I will look because he's had experience in doing you know what we quote and quote the dirty walk work. His father was not rich, you know. They so this where so showing that who you were before, you know, just because your parents are in authority does not mean that you'll be good in authority. Also, just because your parents were not in authority, like David's parents and dad, doesn't mean you will not be good in authority. No, so don't let history dictate your ability to have an impact, a positive impact, when you're put in a position of power. So we see here in David and Goliath that um, the um, story of David and Goliath that's David's dad, you know, Jesse, when his, the three oldest boys are in battle, his dad tells him, take this, you know, take this food. Take this food to your brothers. And it says here that David obeyed. So David is basically anointed king and he's doing Uber Eats. For free. So it's it's quite interesting that some of us will look at it as like, you know, have you forgotten who I was? First of all, you did not even bring me to my own party. They brought, they came to anoint me, and then you left me back and put all the other brothers. But I was the one, I'm the one that some of us, I'm the one that's king now. So you should be respecting because one day I went to a position. And all that, but no, he still, he's still um, obeying his dad. He's still in the same position, even though he's given power. Sometimes, you know, God will give us the anointing and the, you know, you know, pour the oil, but our position does not change. That is very vital because we may not be ready for the position that we are put in. Another thing, you know, we like, you know, God prepares us to be in a position of power and be effective is, you know, for how he trains, is, is through training, the way he trained David. Fight, protect these sheep. Protect these sheep because you're going to be protecting people over, um, eventually. So David tells Saul you know he tells um, tells Saul when he sees Goliath and he's saying who is this who is this person that's defying the army of, of the Lord? Who is the person that can run his mouth like this? Because we said that Goliath is talking for 40 days and 40 nights he's just coming to be like i'm the whoever is ready to fight me I'm, you know showing that he's feeling like a boss and then when david brings the uber eats to his brothers and the brothers even be like what are you doing here who are you they're still looking down on him even after they were they clearly saw that he would be king david turns on like why are you already why are you already forsaking me why are you already looking down on me when all i'm doing is bringing you food and he turns away and is looking at benefits what would be done for the person that would defeat this this man and 
when he hears it, he's excited. That brings him more like, oh, if you will get this, you will, you will get exempted from taxes, you will get a, a king's daughter. I think that was enough for David to be like, yeah, let's do this. Let's go. And so he goes to Saul, and then Saul also looks down on him, and he comes with his strong reasons. Whenever you are looked down on, come with, the Bible says, come with your strong reasons. And David says to Saul, your sheep, um, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, he went out to it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from the mouth. So here's the way David was strange and strained. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Well, already fighting. Um, how many of us are ready to fight uh, lions so we, by holding it by its, uh, by its beard or, and, and killing it directly? This is how fervent and how ready David was to protect sheep. And who is this uncircumcised, this uncircumcised Philippine, uh, Philistine? He will be like one of them. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. That was the thing that ticked him off. Why are you defying the army of the living God? So, David goes ahead and gets a sling. You know, one thing I learned is that he, was, he didn't get a slingshot. He got a sling. This is different. You no, know, sling actually... Now, if you were to get the stone and it can actually go as far, you know, in like 1500 meters, if you were to throw it right, by the time you, you uh, return. So this is something that he has as practice. And it says he pulled one of the stones from his bag. This is a bag that he took down when he was delivering the food. So meaning that he already has these things in preparation for whenever a sheep gets attacked, I am ready. I'm ready to protect. David came prepared, even if he didn't have to protect the sheep. He had, he's used to carrying these things with him just for the protection. So this is how God prepares someone that is meant to be in a position that, he, that has the anointing, that has the timing for power. One of the things we see that's huge that David did when he became king was that he brought the Ark of the Lord back to Jerusalem. The Philistines had taken this Ark, but David won. This ark is where God's presence stays, and David brought it back. He defeated armies. You know, he did multiple things that stood him out. The Lord was with him from the time, even before he came into the position of power. And there are three things we see that David was. He was secure, unlike Saul, as he put his faith in God. He believed that God will win this battle for me because you have defeated the army of the living God. He was patient in hearing God's voice because to, um, whenever Saul, when Saul prayed to defeat the Philistines, he didn't hear anything. But when David prayed in 1 Samuel 38, it says, you shall go and not just pursue. It says, shall I pursue? And the Lord says to him, you shall not just pursue, but you will overcome. You will recover all. You would win everything back. And you see that David was also one that overtook you know so he he was obedient to the calling 
So waiting on God is important when we are trying, when we are waiting for his timing. Because David was anointed, say 15 or 16, but he did not become king until he was 30. About 15 years before he sat on the throne. Why does God make us wait? It says it's when the, our ability and the responsibility, you know, when it doesn't match, he makes, he makes us wait and prepares us, whether it is to fight lions before a Goliath, or it is to go into different battles. He's running from Saul for about you know, 10 years while anointed king. God holds us back to prepare us for an assignment. Because we need to be able to handle the responsibilities of the power, not just the fame. When we are put in a position of authority, we, have, we are famous for that circle that we're in charge of. So how do we know, uh, how do we prepare, how does he prepare us for a position of power? for positive impact. The number one is to point it out is patience. Wait on the Lord and he shall renew your strength. Shall mount on wings like eagles. You shall run and not be weary. You shall run, walk and not faint. You know, also see in Psalms 27, 14, it says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. Uh, so this patience, it's important for training. The second thing we need to know is know who your Lord is. David was aware of who his Lord was, but Saul was not. Saul did things of his own accord. He did things of, I make this decision, you shall not eat honey until, you know, until I win, when God has not assured you victory. Just punishing your people for no reason. You know, Jesus is the perfect example of someone that uses power, and we see in Matthew 26, 53 of how it is that he could have used his power for the um if he wanted to when um when peter goes ahead to pluck out the eyes and he tells peter do you think i cannot pray to my father and he will provide for me more than 12 legions of angels i have this authority but this is not what I meant to do. This is not what I meant to use it for. Whenever we are put in the power, we have to remember in humility that Jesus is the one that lets you be in that power. He is the one that actually lets you be in that position that you are. He uses power for the right reasons. He uses power to forgive sins. He uses power. And uh, see in Matthew 9, 6, it says, I have the power to go ahead and forgive sins. What are you using your power for? What are you using your impact for? The third thing that we can um, train ourselves to use is to repent, which means to change your mindset. David made mistakes, even though he's a man after God's heart. Whenever we make mistakes, well, how do we do it? I mean, when he sees Bathsheba and sleeps with her, he goes to God for mercy in humility. He actually prays, you know, um, see in 2 Samuel 12, 13, he actually says, I have sinned against the Lord. He was very straightforward, like, I have sinned. And then Nathan said to him, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. Saul, when Samuel said, you made this mistake, you went ahead to let and the king, Agath, live. He's, he's trying to, um, no, I didn't, I only did this to offer sacrifice. I only did this to admit your wrongs to the Lord. And that was, that was what actually brought down 
And David's, um, the Samuel said, the Lord has removed you from power. He's not admitting that he's made a mistake when he was put in the position of power. So to point out here that we have anyone that has um, been put down, we all have a position, we all have power. How are we using it? We see here in Acts 1.8 that we all have power if you have given your life to Christ says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. How are you using the power that you have from the Holy Spirit? What are you using the anointing for? Let us pray. Let's ask God to help us to use our power for positive impacts. Use the authority of position. Everyone has something that they are meant to call, um, they're called out to do. Is your power a position of authority of singing where you are meant to minister to people? To bring down the presence of God. Because we just saw that he ministered and David sang, um, played the harp and spirits, a troubled spirit left. Is your power evangelism? What is it that you are called out to do? God has given you power to be effective. Your power just to encourage someone, bring good news when someone is down. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for bringing the word. We pray, O oh Lord, that we shall use our power for positive impacts. Help us to be like David and not Saul. Help us, O oh Lord to repent when we make a mistake. Help us to be secure because we know that you are the one that can do all things. So we put our faith in you. Help us, O oh Lord, in the time of training to be patient, to wait on you. Even if it takes the 15 years from when you tell us that we are called to do something, that we will not fall in the time of waiting. That will be known as your children whenever we go somewhere because we are seen as someone that follows after you. David was watched. A man after your heart. That whenever, even we don't know we're being watched, that we'll be living in obedience. Using the skills that you've given us for positive impact. We thank you, O oh Lord. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.